really good to see everybody. It's really good to see some of those that haven't been here in a while. It's good to see Delitha. Really glad to have her. It's good too. We have a lot of talent in this church. Gosh, it's good to see everybody. And I, I want to say from the family that we, how, how we appreciate all the flowers, the cards, the food, the, everything that the church has done for us through this difficult time that we just went through. And we really do appreciate it. And we love every one of you. And uh, it sure made an impression on all of us. It's really amazing. Uh, when, when you go through something like this, just what all that does mean to you, what everybody's concerned and how much they care. Uh, I really feel good this morning. I, aren't, I, aren't, do you feel good this morning? You know, why do you look so bad? <laughs> I don't understand that. But I, I just really do feel good this morning. Uh, you know, I really believe uh, Taylor's probably... Before they can be a tailor, before you can be a tailor, I think you really have to love practical jokes. I just, I just think that's probably one of the criteria for becoming a tailor. Because did you ever go buy some clothes? You know, and you know how they'll take a piece of soap and they mark the bottom of you know where to cut the pants off. Did you ever do that? You guys sure did. I know. You know, I don't know why they go to all that trouble. You know, but they say go put, go put the pants on. So you put it on. And then they go down there and they say, now, where do you want to wear them? Now, they say, pull your pants up right where you wear them. So you do, and then they take that chalk and they mark it. I don't know why they do that, because when that tailor gets that, they're going to make it at least three inches longer than what you mark it. You know, I think they do it for a joke. And so I, I, I went and got some, the, the church Christmas gave me a gift certificate. I went over and got some new clothes. They marked them, sent them off to two weeks to get them back. I put them on this morning. <laughs> <laughs> the pants are like three inches too long. Susie said, well, you're just going to have to pull them up. You know, I got them up here under my armpits, <laughs> you know, and that, that's the reason I got to try to keep my coat buttoned, you know, because they say one of the signs of an old man, you know, they'll pull their pants way up here under their, you know, other armpits, you know, and so I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting old. I don't know, but whatever it is, I, I really don't know what it is, but uh, I do thank the church for the gift certificate and I do appreciate the clothes and, and I'll take them somewhere and get them about three or four inches cut off the bottom of them and then I'll be able to wear them like I like to wear them you know but we appreciate that and we really do appreciate all the church has done for us it really meant a lot to us uh, as we went through that time and you know I tell you I really feel good this morning that these are some of the flowers that were sent to the funeral and we had them brought up here after the service, after the funeral service, we all went up to the home place, up to Mother's, and the church brought what food was left up there. And we had kin folks came in from uh, Springfield, Missouri, that we hadn't seen in years and years. And you know how that goes. You have people come in that you just don't ever see. And, and, and we were just having a regular family reunion, and it dawned on Susan and I that Mother was really having a family reunion at the same time. And, you know, Grace Surrett, it's amazing, she died the day before Mother did. Well, Mother was in the hospital, so we didn't tell Mother. You know, I thought, well, there's no point in, in worrying her. And so we didn't tell Mother that Grace died. And I don't know if you can be shocked when you go to heaven or not, but I thought, what a shock that would be when Mother got there the next day, and there's Grace Surrett there to, to greet her, you know. But I know that Grace and Mother are just having the times of their eternal life right now. I believe they are. And, uh, you know, uh, I was, uh, part of my sermon here is about Noah, and it just dawned on me, you know, I don't know if you realized it or not, but a little over a week ago, my mother shook hands with Noah and with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the apostles, John the Baptist, King David, Adam, Abel, Gideon, Elijah, Elisha. Boy, what a family reunion. Not to mention my dad and my brother and all her brothers and her mother and dad. And, and I can't hardly keep from rejoicing. I'm sad for me. I'm sad for those that loved mother. 
but I know she is having the time of her eternal life. You know, it's amazing. Uh, I, I don't want to get into all of it. it. It was when she passed away, she was in ICU, and it, it was really a bad time. And it really did challenge our faith. Uh, because she had such a struggle to breathe and we had to hold her arms down because she was trying to tear the mast off and the, ma the oxygen off and, and she just got weaker and weaker and her blood pressure dropped until she died. And, and that was really hard. You know, hold your mother's arms down knowing that she probably didn't understand why you were smothering her to death. And I know that's what she felt like, that we wouldn't let her remove whatever it was that she probably thought was keeping her from breathing. But you know, when I was watching the monitor and I saw her blood pressure dropping and she was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then when the heart monitor flatlined, I had the strangest feeling. It, it was probably opposite, an opposite reaction to what you would think that you would have. It, it just seemed like the Lord was right there in that room. And when I saw that, her heart got weaker and weaker, then it flatlined. I just wanted to say, praise God, she's home at last. And that's the way I feel about it. And I miss her. I'll always miss her until I go over to the other side. But I feel so good because you don't know what a struggle it was for mother just to exist every day. She had got to the point to where she had no quality of life. She couldn't hardly breathe. And I know one thing, when she drew her last breath here, the next breath she took, she had no lung trouble. She took the first good breath that she had taken in years when that monitor flatlined. And I, I tell you what, I, I miss my mother, and you know, I would call her several times a day, I'd go up there and fix her lunch, and Susie would go fix her dinner, her breakfast, and, all of that, and, and several times a day, I, I'll catch myself thinking, oh, I need to, I need to call Mother. Or it'll be 2.30, I'll think, oh, I didn't go warm up Mother's dinner or whatever, you know, and, and so that'll probably go on for a long time. But I know that Mother is all right. Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you ready? She was ready. She was ready to go, and I don't know how many times she kept saying, oh, I wish I could just go home. I wish I could just go home where she went home. And I know she's waiting for her children. She's waiting for her church family to follow. And I know that when I cross River Jordan, she'll probably be one of the first ones there to greet me, introduce me around. And I know she'll be glad to see each and every one of you when you cross River Jordan. Wednesday, uh, anybody in a hurry today? <laughs> uh, turn, if you will, to Hebrews. The 11th chapter. Turn to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, but I'm going to speak just a little bit out of 1 Peter. Jason brought a, an absolutely, well, they always are, but I thought it was an exceptionally good Wednesday night on trials. And uh, he really brought out a lot of good points. And, and since that's kind of the springboard for my sermon, I want to read a little bit in the first uh, uh, chapter of First Peter. He says, Wherein ye now re greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness, through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than the, of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found into the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, what's he saying there? He says, you are rejoicing. And the reason they're rejoicing is because of the resurrection, which gives us hope. So it says, now you're rejoicing because a Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, who will also quicken your mortal bodies, and you'll be raised from the dead. And that's certainly something to rejoice about. Not only that, he says you have a reward, you have a treasure laid up in heaven for who? Those that are kept by the power of God, which means the Christians. But he said for a little while you may be in heaviness, and the reason you are is because you're going through manifold temptations or trials. And as Jason brought out, the word manifold means multicolored. There's such a variety of trials that you must go through while you're down here. If need be, it says if need be, you go through these. Well, what does it mean by if need be? Well, I, I gave a lot of thought to that, Jason, this week while since you preached on that. And, you know, I got to thinking about the trials that we go through. And I think there's two purposes for the trials, all right? One of the reasons is it shows you or it shows me when we go through severe testing, do I have the right kind of faith? Is it head knowledge faith or is it heart knowledge? You see, a lot of people missed heaven by 18 inches between here and here. And what the manifold, the multicolored, the various trials that God allows us to go through does is bring out what kind of faith is it? Is it a head knowledge faith? Because you see, if it is, you, you'll jump overboard. I mean, you'll abandon ship. When trials come, you cannot stand the heat. But if it's the right kind of faith, you're anchored to God, you're trusting in God, even though you may not understand why you're going through what you're going through, you're trusting God that he knows what he's doing. But I believe the primary reason isn't for you at all. The primary reason, I believe, is to show the world what God has placed within you. What is this faith? It isn't an earthly faith. It's an unearthly faith. It's a faith that man, man can't account for. It's a faith, it's something that God has put within man that helps him go through, come out victorious over any and all trials that God sees fit to let us go through. Why do I say God puts the faith there? Well, because in Ephesians, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but is a gift of God. Now, keep this in mind. When you're going through a severe trial, a severe testing, please keep in mind, the world is looking on. Your neighbors are watching. Your kin folks are watching. The people you work with are watching. And when you are able to stand up under that severe testing and trials, they know you've got something that they don't have. How many like shock absorbers? Well, you know, it's kind of funny thing about shock absorbers. You don't see them, do you, unless you put your car on the rack. And when you buy a car, it's got shock absorbers on it. And, and you know, you can buy a car and you can say, okay, look, I don't want air conditioning. I don't want a radio. I don't want a moon roof, roof. I don't want power seats, power doors. See, there's options. There's things that you can leave off. But what if we say, look, I don't want shock absorbers because I never see them anyway, and I'm not spending good money for something that the neighbors can't see. <laughs> a lot of times people buy a car, you know, because they want everybody to see they got a car. But see, when I was a little child, I went to Grove, Oklahoma, and, and I was just small, and I went to a farm there, and I was going to go pick blueberries one day, and my uncle hooked a, hooked a horse to a wagon. And uh, 
I'd never ridden in a wagon before, and I thought, man, this is going to be great. We're going to get to ride this wagon about a mile and a half way back over some flint rock roads, and we're going to pick blueberry. That liked to kill me. That, I mean, and I was a little kid, but you know what? That wagon not only didn't have shock absorbers, it didn't have springs. And if you don't have springs or shock absorbers, life will shake you to pieces. Now, let me tell you something about shock absorbers. Shock absorbers do not remove the bumps in the road. Is that right? What shock absorbers do is keep the bumps in the road from shaking the car apart. And folks, if you're saved, that will not exempt you from trials. It won't. And you know, I hear so much of this, and it's such utterly ridiculous, when preachers will say, when you get saved, everything is going to be rosy. Folks, it's not going to be rosy. But you know, they'll tell you that. Listen, if you're saved, you're going to have money in the bank. You're always going to be in good health. You know, everything's just going to go your way. The Bible doesn't teach that. And if you will study the Bible, you will find that the all-time saints had just as many or perhaps more trials and problems than you have. But the difference is, if you have the faith that God gives, it's like shock absorbers. It helps you withstand those trials. Now, listen, springs are a wonderful thing, too. Your car needs springs. But did you ever see a car that had springs, but the shock absorbers were gone? That's the funniest thing. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. I followed a car like that one time down the road, and every time he hit a bump, the back end just go, wow, 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 wow. And there are guys going down the road like this, you know. And they just keep, it just keeps doing that. And about the time that that thing would kind of level out, he'd hit the rail tracks again. <laughs> you know, it, it just, I mean, it was funny, see. And you see, faith is like the shock absorber. Some people go through life just bouncing up and down, bouncing up and down. There's nothing there to anchor them to stabilize them so that they can make it through life. They just bounce up and down. Did you ever see people like that? I have. Happy one day, bad the next. Happy the next day. Because their whole life is dependent upon happenings. See? If everything's going to rosy today, they're just great. But tomorrow they lose their job. Oh, man, the bottom drops out. But somebody gives them $50. Boy, they're great again. <laughs> See, I mean, it's just an up and down thing and up and down thing and up and down thing, and I'm not going to have time to get into my sermon. So come back tonight because I'm going to preach on Noah. All right? But I want to tell you this. If you don't have God in your life, you don't have a chance. Because no matter, and even though this world is going to shake you apart, and it does, it shakes people apart. That's the reason you can pick up the paper and find where people commit suicide all the time. Why? They can't stand it any longer. They're not anchored or anything. Their life is just being up and down, shook apart until they come to the point they just can't take it anymore. But that's not the worst part. That's not the worst part. I want to read you the worst part because some of those people do endure into the end without God. And you know, I don't know how people live without God in their life. I do not know. But some people do and they they, they, they go through life being bounced around, jarred around, going through all kinds of problems and heartaches without God, without anything to soften the blow and give them any hope. They don't have any hope. 
the, folks, the tragic part is even though you make it through this life, when you come to the end of this life, that's when your real problems are going to start. If you don't have God, I want to read this to you. Well, let's see if I can find them. It's in Revelation. And this is men that lived upon earth or will live upon earth. They had everything going their way, although they had trials and tribulations just like you do. But when the Lord comes back, listen to this, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Boy, listen, I'll tell you something. You better have a shock absorber when this happens. And that shock absorber better be faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Why? No shock absorber. They couldn't take it. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? If you think you got problems now, you haven't seen nothing yet. If you don't have Christ, if you're not anchored to Christ, if you don't have the faith that he gives you to withstand the trials now, what's going to happen when the real problems begin? <coughs> Jesus said, don't fear the one that can take your life. But fear the one that can take your life and also destroy your soul. God's the one you better fear. <coughs> I'm sorry I didn't get to, to preach my sermon this morning. That's really just the introduction. But if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to tell you this. It's once appointed in the man to die and you're not going to get out of it. You're not going to get out of it, folks. I don't care whether you're godly or ungodly. It's once appointed unto man to die. The righteous die just like the sinner dies, but we're all going to die, and we all know this, right? So why not prepare for it? Because you don't know when it's coming. You know, two days before my mother died, was probably the two best days she's had in a long, long time. Isn't that right, Susie? Susie told me, she said, boy, your mother's just doing so good. She's feeling better than she has in a long time. And I gave her some, I mean, this is kind of funny, but uh, I gave her some, uh, it's called royal jelly. Do y'all know what royal jelly is? Well, royal jelly is what the queen bee lives on. It's the most nutritious food known to man, and it has all your B vitamins. And so, uh, we bought her some raw jelly, and it was in a, a, a honey base. And so they've been putting it on her toast every morning. And she said, boy, that raw jelly has really helped me. She said, it helps me walk straighter. Well, she's weak, you know. She just wobbled like this, you know, but the raw jelly is helping her walk straighter. Well, she walks straight now. And she don't need the raw jelly. She has the royal king. If you don't have Jesus, whether you do or whether you don't, you're going to die. So why not prepare for it? But I, I was going to say, the two days, last two days, she felt better than she had in I don't know how long. Fell and broke a hip. She died. I don't know whether I'm going to get home today, and you don't know either. 
I got a better chance if I drive. Not anymore. Yeah, not anymore. That's right. Yeah. It's kind of funny the other day my wife was driving. And I don't know why I was so nervous. But I was, Oop, watch that. Oh, stop. Oh, watch that guy. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and I did that. And, you know, that really gets on your nerves. You know, I know it does. And, and she said, don't you have any faith? I said, I'm looking at a woman here that's rolled a car, run another one in the bridge, and I don't know how many times she's curbed it and roofed the wheel, and she asked me if I got any faith. <laughs> yes, in God. <laughs> <laughs> and see, you can have faith in your friends and your mother and your dad, but you better have faith in God. You know why? Because it says that you've got to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You've got to take what God says and believe it and stand on it. If you don't know Jesus, your Savior, he is more than willing to save you right now. But he does it by faith that he gives you. It's by grace through faith. And he's, as it is written, he will say, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Just call upon his name. Say, God, I believe you. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe that he paid for all my sins. And I am trusting him and him only for eternal life. Just simple as that. Let's stand.